Welcome to Heritage Events Live, School Choice Myth. We're thrilled to have you here. Here are some tips for making the most of your virtual experience with us. Please submit questions through the questions tab. Feel free to share your name and affiliation. We'd love to know who you are. If there are any minor technical issues, we ask for your patience, as many of us are working from home and using home internet. I will now pass it over to Dr. Lindsay Burke, the Director of Heritage's Center for Education Policy and Will Skillman, Fellow in Education. We hope you enjoy the program. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lindsay Burke, Director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. School Choice has been going gangbusters for the past dozen years. What started as an academic exercise by Milton Friedman in 1955 materialized into the first modern day school choice program in 1990 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Today, there are 65 school choice programs in 29 states and Washington, D.C. These take the form of school vouchers, tax credit scholarships, education savings accounts, and more than half a million children have their lives changed every year by being able to attend a private school of choice. The track record of the benefits of school choice are clear. Stronger academic outcomes, statistically significant improvements in academic achievement, increases in graduation rates, safer schools, happier parents, and a host of other positive later life outcomes. And yet, skeptics remain. There are those who contend that school choice harms children left behind in public schools and that school choice siphons money from those same schools. There are people who claim that school choice hurts students with special needs, that it balkanizes society, or that it's unconstitutional. There are even those who claim that today's school choice programs have racist origins. And something I find particularly frustrating, that middle and low income parents won't be able to make good choices for their children. These are school choice myths, but as Mark Twain was credited with saying, a lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is still lacing up its boots. So we are here today to tackle the truth. And in the new book, School Choice Myths, Setting the Record Straight on Education Freedom, edited by Corey DeAngelis of the Reason Foundation and Neil McCluskey of the Cato Institute, the contributors do just that. And I'm delighted to have contributed a chapter along with my co-author, Jason Bedrick of EdChoice, chapter nine, check it out. School choice myth needs regulation to ensure access and quality. That's the myth that we bust in that chapter. As Jason and I explain, while the alleged need to regulate school choice may sound seductive, regulations have demonstrated unintended consequences. So policymakers should refrain from interfering with private school autonomy in ways that limit the ability of families to choose from a diverse selection of schools, wielding the regulatory pen with humility. Overregulation, we explain, harms school choice by restricting the academic freedom and the differences in learning models that make it distinct from public education. But there are so many other myths to bust, and we have a great panel here today to do just that. So I'd like to invite our panelists to turn on their cameras now and join us on the virtual stage. First, we will hear from Corey DeAngelis, who is one of the book's co-editors. Corey is the director of school choice at the Reason Foundation, and he is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Then we will hear from Phil Magnus, who is a senior research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research and is the author of numerous works on economic history, taxation, economic inequality, the history of slavery, and education policy in the United States. And then finally, we will hear from Inez Stepman, who is a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum and a senior contributor to The Federalist. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Corey to kick us off. Hey, thank you so much for the kind words, Lindsay, and thanks for the uh, introduction and uh, discussion of your chapter, Chapter 9 in School Choice Myths, Setting the Re Record Straight on Education Freedom. Just want to point out really quickly in my opening that this is a really important topic. The timing of this book couldn't have come at any, at any better time because although school choice has always been a good idea, it, the case for school choice is becoming stronger and stronger 
particularly right now, because it's one thing for the school system to fail to educate children in particular locations year after year, despite throwing more and more money at the problem. It's another conversation altogether for the schools to not even reopen and then them still get your child's education dollars without even providing them with in-person instruction at all, or even giving families that option to return to schools. The most recent data that I saw on this, when Education Week stopped tracking the reopening decisions of schools, three out of every four of the 100 largest school districts in the United States were not reopening with any in-person instruction available to any families at all uh, in their districts. So I think families are looking at this and they're saying that there's no good reason to fund an institution regardless of whether it's meeting their needs and regardless whether they're opening their doors. This would be viewed as ridiculous in any other sector of the economy. Just imagine if your local grocery store decided not to reopen because it was what they argue is too dangerous to do so. It would be ridiculous to force families to continue spending money at that grocery store regardless of them even giving you groceries each week. So what I've argued is that if a, if a grocery store doesn't reopen, families can rightfully take their money elsewhere. And that goes for taxpayer funded programs like food stamps as well. If your Walmart doesn't reopen, you can take your food stamps to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or a different provider of the grocery service. Similarly, if your school doesn't reopen, families should be able to take their children's education dollars elsewhere. Um, and the reason for that is because the money is supposed to be meant for educating the child. It's not supposed to be meant for propping up and protecting a government monopoly. I mean, just look at places across the country. There, it, you know, it's one thing to not reopen the schools, but you look in Fairfax County uh, public schools in the D.C. area where I'm located. They haven't reopened their schools. They're doing the uh, fully remote option for option for families. And uh, you have the teachers union out in Fairfax actually pushing to keep the schools closed until August 2021. So it's not just a short term thing. They want to keep their doors closed for a very long time. Meanwhile, you have the private sector doing something completely different. You have private businesses, private schools, daycares, uh, restaurants and grocery stores. They've been fighting to reopen while the public school system has been fighting to keep its doors shut. And I don't think it has to do anything with uh, the difference in motivations between people in the sectors. I don't think that people in the public sector are inherently bad people and people in the private sector are inherently good people. I think it's a difference of incentives. One of these sectors gets your money regardless of how well they meet your individual needs. Look at Fairfax County as well. They're also paying bus drivers to drive around town without any students in them. And so this also goes to show that this is more about prioritizing the adults in the system and protecting the monopoly than actually meeting the needs of the children in the system and, and the customers. Fairfax actually also, uh, uh, they have been opening the schools. So they're not opening the schools, right? Because it's too dangerous to do so, but they're actually opening some of the elementary schools. From my count, it was about 20% of the elementary uh, schools in the system were opening for daycare services and they were charging families up to $360 per child per week, which I would argue is a form of extortion because they're essentially forcing families to pay twice for a service that was previously available to them in other years. And so this all has shown families that there's no good reason to fund the institution when you can fund the students directly instead. And in fact, the latest polling we have on this shows that support for school choice or funding the students directly has gone up by 10 percentage points since April. In a very short amount of time at the national level, support for school choice has gone up from 67 to 77 percent of, of the uh, population of families who had children in public schools. And it, that, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me all that much because the public school system just isn't there for them this year. And another way of thinking about school choice is this same idea, funding the student instead of the institution. A lot of people get lost in the jargon of school choice. What does that actually mean? And we already do this with other taxpayer funded initiatives like food stamps and Pell Grants and the GI Bill with higher education. The funding doesn't go to the community college and we don't force low income students to spend that money at the community college. No, we allow them to take that money and spend it at the community college that they want, but they could also spend it at a public university or a private religious or non-religious uh, university of their choosing. Same thing with pre-K programs. We don't residentially assign people to pre-Ks. Uh, with pre-K programs, including Head Start, for example, the money goes to families. And I'm not saying that pre-K and Pell Grants are a good or bad idea. All I'm saying is that if we're going to have the funding in the system, it should go rightfully so to the individual. And with uh, the pre-K programs, you can choose regularly a public or private provider of pre-K services. 
We don't residentially assign people to government run grocery stores with food stamps. We give the money to families and they can choose a Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. And that's the difference between the system that we have now in public schools and funding individuals uh, directly. And so a lot of the same people who support funding students directly when it comes to pre-K and Pell Grants and the GI Bill don't support it when it comes to K-12 education. And the only reason that I can conjure up is because of a difference in power dynamic. The norm in pre-K and higher ed is you already have a high degree of choice. In K-12, through there's a special interest that's entrenched in the current system that profits from getting your money regardless of whether you choose to send your child there or regardless of whether you're even satisfied with the product. So they fight really hard to prevent families from having these options. And that's why we uh, you know, uh, contributed to this book, School Choice Myths, because they fight really hard and they keep repeating these same things over and over and over again, despite uh, the basic logic to the contrary and the overwhelming amount of evidence that debunks all these myths. So check out the school choice myths. We have 12 different myths that we debunk. One being that I'll just start out with is that school choice siphons away money from public schools. That's not true. Public schools actually siphon away money from families. School choice programs just return that money to the hands of the rightful owners, and then families are able to choose. You would similarly never hear someone say that allowing people to choose their grocery store siphons away money from Walmart. That would be absolutely ridiculous, and no one would ever say that because we all understand that the money doesn't belong to any particular institution. It belongs to the family and we should apply that same logic to K through 12 education. And secondly, when people are saying that they believe this will defund, giving families a choice will defund the public schools, what does that say about what they believe about people's residentially assigned public schools? It's that they understand that people will choose a, a better option when given the choice. So on the one hand, they try to say, we don't need school choice because public schools are so great. But then on the other hand, school, giving people an option will defund the public schools. Well, which one is it? I think the reality is they understand that people will take their money elsewhere when given the option. And, and, and I can keep going on this myth and others, but I, I've hit you know about seven minutes. I wanna let other people talk as well and then get to Q and A. So thank you, Lindsay. Great, thank you, Corey. Uh, really great overview. I'd like to turn it over now to Phil Magnus. You tackled a tricky topic in this book. Uh, so we'd love to hear your thoughts and talk a little bit about your chapter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, everyone, for organizing this. But I, I want to talk a bit about uh, the chapter that I investigated, which addresses a uh, myth that's come up in the last few years, particularly on the left and particularly from uh, teachers unions and some of the more traditional uh, opponents of school vouchers. And that is the claim that vouchers take their historical root in segregation. This is an argument that is of a relatively recent invention. I'd say uh, post-2010 is when uh, some of the anti-voucher activists started enlisting it. And the claim is that uh, because voucher theory associated with Milton Friedman's 1955 article arose at roughly the same time as Brown versus Board of Education was being decided, uh, they tried to impart a motive onto Milton Friedman and impart a motive onto voucher advocates in general that claims that uh, this was a response, a reaction to uh, court order desegregation uh, coming down from the Supreme Court and Brown versus Board. Uh, there are several problems with this as history and, and what I sought to do in the chapter is tackle them by giving an actual historically grounded, sourced and evidenced uh, uh, outline of where voucher policy came from. And of course, the, the, the most obvious uh, and immediate problem with this claim that it arose as a backlash against desegregation is that vouchers actually predate uh, Brown versus Board by over 150 years. Uh, we can actually go back into the works of Adam Smith in the late 18th century, Thomas Paine, uh, John Stuart Mill. These are the early theorists that laid out the case for vouchers uh, between roughly about the 1770s and the 1850s. Uh, interestingly enough, Adam Smith, Thomas Paine, and John Stuart Mill are all abolitionists as well. They're uh, uh, anti-slavery figures in their own day, so it'd be very odd that they would be uh, associated with this notion of segregation. Uh, we also see a prehistory of early adoption of vouchers and voucher-like mechanisms in, uh, in rural New England in the late 19th century, 
And then fast forwarding into the 20th century, uh, even in 1947, there was a case out in California where uh, uh, the local school district was uh, segregating Hispanic Americans uh, and white Americans and sending them to separate schools. Uh, it's a precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. And the editor of the, of the Orange County Register, R.C. Hoyles, actually editorialized against segregation and said this is an indictment of the way that the public school system uh, basically ruins education and enforces racism on people. So he was actually making a, an early case for vouchers as the alternative to the segregated public school system. So let's jump into the uh, the historical material around Milton Friedman. So he writes his article, it pu it's published in 1955, making the economic case for competition in education, basically what we consider school voucher theory today. Friedman had been working on this article for several years. I've dug in his archives and seen the correspondence about it. And uh, just by a pure matter of coincidence, Brown versus Board of Education was handed down when Friedman is about two thirds of the way through writing his article. Um, he was initially kind of uh, uh, taken aback by it because he, he asked himself the question, what does this mean for my voucher case? And he ends up appending basically a page long footnote to his already written article that explains what he thinks is going to happen um, in a school voucher system under this newly ordered court desegregation. And Friedman is absolutely unambiguous in this footnote in indicating that he considers segregation to be the greater evil. Uh, segregation is the problem that needs to be uh, gotten rid of. Uh, but he actually walks through the logic and he makes the case that vouchers themselves are going to, if implemented, undermine the segregationist position. His whole idea is that moral suasion is more powerful than government edict at a, achieving social change in a policy. And if you allow competition to enter into the school system, as a voucher seeks to do, the process over time will be students moving away from the segregated schools and toward the desegregated schools. Uh, that this will be a, uh, an organic process that will actually help uh, assist and speed uh, the process of getting rid of segregation uh, in addition to what the federal courts are doing. So Friedman's argument is put forth on a theoretical basis. Uh, vouchers do uh, burst onto the national scene. There are states, both in the North and the South, that uh, consider adopting voucher mechanisms. The real driver, though, in the 1950s is not segregationists trying to resist Brown versus Board. It's actually mostly coming out of the Northeast in uh, Catholic and religious schools that are seeking to uh, um, actually enter into competition with the public school system that had been excluded by uh, punitive laws, including discriminatory laws dating to the 1880s. Uh, but in the midst of all this battle, there are instances of the southern states where uh, some of them try to respond to Brown versus Board by uh, either shuttering their public school system or attempting to subsidize private schools, which kind of sounds like a voucher mechanism. And this is the little kernel of truth that uh, the voucher opponents seize on to and try to spin as if it were a uh, um, evidence that vouchers and segregation were linked at the hip. The problem here, though, is that these, uh, these particular programs were not offered to introduce educational competition. They were offered to transfer uh, educational exclusion out of the public sector and into basically like these shell operations. They called them segregation academies that were set up uh, to basically supplant the public school system. When it turns out that some of the voucher advocates were pushing against not only public schools, but privately subsidized segregation academies, uh, the segregationists lashed out at voucher policy. So I study one case in, in Virginia, which was kind of ground zero for the, uh, the school closure uh, problem uh, during the segregation era. They had a, a major Supreme Court case and several federal court rulings against uh, the segregation academies, especially Prince Edward County in the, uh, the center of the state. It shuttered its public school system. So I looked into that to see what the voucher advocates did and what the segregation advocates did. Well, it turns out, lo and behold, the segregationists actually aligned with the state's teachers unions, the Virginia Education Association, the uh, state chapter of the NEA, uh, in trying to keep vouchers out of the public sphere, out of policy, because they believed what uh, one of the segregation theorists uh, claimed would happen was that, uh, and I'm quoting him here, he says, 
that if we allow vouchers to enter into competition with public or private schools, we are going to see the quote, Negro engulfment of our education institutions. This is a horrendously over the top racist argument. And this is uh, John S. Battle. He's the chief litigator for the segregationists. And he basically says, if you open up schools to competition, what will happen? Some white students will leave, black students, being given the right to choose which school to take their uh, uh, their money, their educational money to, would enter into previously all white public schools, and as a result, integration would happen. He's basically saying exactly what Milton Friedman predicted would happen. And in the wake of this prediction, uh, you actually get a reaction on the state and local level from segregated school districts to try to cap enrollment at uh, public schools or to redo the zoning maps to prevent black neighborhoods from being able to go to uh, previously all white schools. Uh, so you actually get a, the exact opposite of what the anti-voucher activists are saying is what plays out. The segregationists and the anti-voucher teams uh, align together in the late 1950s and early 1960s. We even have a very clear and conclusive case of this when it goes before the Supreme Court in 1964, the case of Griffin versus Prince Edward County, which is um, a lawsuit filed against this county in central Virginia that basically shut down its public school system and transferred the money over to a uh, privately run white segregationist academy and excluded black students entirely from education, basically shut them down and said, you are not going to be able to go to school if you are an African-American and you live in this county in this period. Well, the federal courts strike down at this immediately. There's a ruling in 1961 at the federal district court level. And what it actually does is it barred the county of Prince Edward from even accessing voucher money from the state. It said that as long as you remain segregated, this violates the letter of the law, which says that uh, there must be educational competition. You cannot access voucher money if you are going to use it in a segregated institution. So uh, already you have one strike against it. You fast forward three years as this case makes its way to the Supreme Court, and we actually have records from the leading pro-voucher organization in the U.S. at the time, Citizens for Educational Freedom. It was a uh, mostly Catholic religious school oriented uh, institution that was based out of uh, St. Louis, had a major chapter in Wisconsin. Uh, Father Virgil Bloom was one of the leading voucher advocates at the time. And, and basically the organizer of this. He's, a, uh, he's actually in correspondence with Milton Friedman, uh, runs throughout the pro-voucher movement. He actually writes an amicus brief to the Supreme Court arguing that if Prince Edward County is continuing to segregate, they should be permanently barred from having any access whatsoever to a voucher program. So not only do you have this myth that's being perpetrated to try and align vouchers with segregationism, the actual truth, the actual evidence that we have from the leading voucher uh, advocacy organization in the 1950s and 60s is it's pro-integration. It's actually taking a stance against uh, the misuse of public money toward um, uh, segregated purposes and trying to make sure that vouchers are not in any way supporting uh, uh, this horrific institution. So uh, basically what we've fallen into is a trap where uh, uh, the anti-voucher advocates are revising history. They're making uh, uh, not only claims that are misleading, but claims that are outright false and obscure the fact that their own institutions, including the state chapter in Virginia of the NEA, were aligned with the segregationists throughout this period. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the other panelists, and uh, I guess we can continue our conversation, but I'd be happy to take any questions on this uh, in the Q&A as well. Great. Thank you, Phil. That was a great overview. We're getting tons of great questions coming in. Keep them coming. We're already getting requests for uh, notes on your talk, Phil, so uh, great work. Uh, the best notes are Chapter 2. It's Phil's chapter in School Choice Myths, so you can look it up there. Uh, Inez, take us home from here. Hi, thanks, Lindsay. Um, and and I'm gonna to veer off a little bit um, from this theme. I do have a chapter in, in School Choice Myths. It's it's regarding um, students with special needs and how school choice actually serves them better than the current system and better than a web uh, of both federal and state uh, regulation and law that is supposed to protect them, but often too often um, families say really doesn't and doesn't ensure that they have uh, full access to the education that they deserve. But um, I am going to shift a little bit 
we are right after an election or perhaps not fully after an election, who knows? Um, so let me be sort of the bearer of some good news. I, I do think that we're standing on the precipice of the biggest education revolution in generations. Um, and, and that's very, very good for, I mean, I'm a conservative. I think that's very, very good for conservatives. Um, I think we have the opportunity to create the biggest domestic policy and cultural victory that we've had in 70 years. And the only question in my mind is whether we'll actually seize that opportunity going forward. So, I mean, the, the, the lament from the right and from conservatives about the leftward tilt of the education system goes back at least in the modern era to William F. Buckley Jr. and God man, Gone and Man at Yale. Um, but only recently, I think very much to our detriment, has the right paid too much attention to the K-12 system. Um, and this is this is really a shame. I mean, the, the kind of things I used to work with state legislatures, legislators, and oftentimes um, they would tell me that it was actually difficult in Republican dominated states to fill the post of education chairman and of, of various committees um, because the right simply was not interested in the issue. It wasn't viewed as, as a top priority issue um, on the right. And, and that's, that's really been uh, a shame. And as I say, to our detriment, because public schooling in the United States historically has had um, a very uh, both both conservative and patriotic um, core purpose at its core. Uh, the purpose of having a, a public investment at all, which was not at all a, a foregone conclusion in, in a country that is is as free as the United States, where the government is very limited um, in comparison to a, a lot of other um, countries and, and governments. Uh, it was not at all a foregone conclusion that we would have this massive public investment in universal education. But, but the purpose of that investment, as argued in the founding and, and as continued to be argued throughout um, the, the 19th century afterwards, um, the core of and the purpose of that investment was to shape informed citizens capable of bearing the responsibilities of maintaining the republic. Right. So it's it, reading, arithmetic, um, all, all of the things that are incredibly important, of course, uh, academic performance. Um, initially, when we had this debate as a country, those all came secondary to the idea that we needed an informed population that understood the government that we have, the system that we have, and the ideas behind it in order to maintain that system. So, I, I mean, I don't think it'll surprise many people uh, listening to this that despite those origins um, and despite a robust private school sector, right, and two million homeschoolers, uh, dozens of limited school choice programs, right, that uh, I'm not sure that I, I agree with you, Lindsay, when you called it gangbusters. We have passed a lot of programs in a relatively short period of time, but those programs are very limited. Too often, they're limited to a small percentage of the population. Um, but despite all of that success, um, oftentimes public schools are still the default, right? Um, and public schools, unfortunately, are, are often teaching the opposite of what students need to, to learn to grow into the kind of informed patriots that Ronald Reagan continually referenced in his speeches, who hope would emerge. Um, and, and But I, I did say that I started this office as uh, being the bearer of good news. And, and I think that this is actually about to change in a big way um, for three reasons. First, uh, President Trump has shown a megawatt spotlight on this issue, not just school choice as a policy issue, but specifically the indoctrination that is too often par for the course in the public system, such as drawing on materials from the discredited 1619 Project or from Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, which is a very popular supplemental textbook in high schools across America. And the, the second piece of, of this first point that I think is, is really uh, reason to be to be cheered or optimistic. Uh, President Trump's biggest applause lines on the campaign trail were often uh, in regards to patriotic education and school choice. Um, Americans now know that this is a top priority issue. Uh, they know that we can't continue to graduate generations like mine, I'm a millennial, um, and the older cohort of Gen Z, where only one in five of us can pass the citizenship exam given to naturalizing immigrants, right? So we're not learning basic facts in public school um, about how the system works. We're talking things like how many branches of the federal government are there, right? Um, really basic grade school things, but only one in five people under the age of 45 can actually answer uh, or pass those kinds of basic questions. I mean, that's an indictment on the public school system. Um, on the flip side, um, so on the, sorry, my dog is snoring. 
Um, on the flip side, uh, you have you have this incredible ignorance about our, our uh, country that is being produced by the public schools. And then on the flip side, you have a generation that's utterly convinced uh, that America's racist, that it's sexist, it's fundamentally unjust. You see this in survey after survey after survey. There's a big break in the generations between Gen X and older and then millennials and younger. Um, I, I think the, the riots and the toppling the statues of our founders and Lincoln uh, that we've seen in the streets are a direct consequence of the worldview that is being taught in the public schools. But the good news, again, is that I think we are finally waking up to this um, as an incredibly important issue, which is why I do see a great opportunity on the horizon for us. Um, the second reason for optimism is that the, the Republican Party was extremely successful in the state elections. And despite how much we hear about this being a crossover issue, and it is with voters, right? So there are a lot of Democratic voters, especially Black and Hispanic Democratic voters, who do support school choice and support it very strongly. But when you're talking about state legislatures, um, almost always you're talking about Republicans passing school choice programs. So. Um, that that is good news for the possibility of passing uh, more school choice programs in the states this year. Um, and then finally, uh, the last few months, I think, and, and Corey alluded to this, the last few months have really laid bare the self-interested nature of the system for so many families, right? Um, parents, you know, have have found their concerns not just to be, you know, negotiated with or, or, or um, you know, somebody, they have not been treated as, as people to sit down with and negotiate and in good faith. They have been treated um, just abominably by the system as though the concerns they have about their, their students and their children essentially not getting an education for, you know, three months, for six months, for nine months um, is, is something that uh, is, is sort of an unfair ask to make of the system, uh, despite all of the money that they as taxpayers are investing in it. And I think that this, this moment has really laid that there. And then finally, uh, along the same vein, because so much of, of um, the last uh, several months has been done as virtual education, uh, parents are finally having the chance to see what their kids are learning. Um, and, and a lot of them are not happy about that. They're seeing, you know, the critical race theory being taught to um, 10 year olds, right? Um, they're, they're, they're seeing the materials that are being used in social studies classes. Um, and and they're, not, they're not particularly happy about that. And I think that that's definitely something, an impulse that we should encourage and work with um, as a policy matter. So I think all of this adds up to potentially a huge rear for school choice if we're willing to take it. Um, I will close with a brief warning, although unusually for me, this is a very optimistic talk, uh, but I do have a brief warning. Um, I think Trump has shown us a great way to get focus and energy behind this issue. I, I, and, and that's connecting this issue of school choice, which is so important from a policy realm, um, to what kids learn and marketed a solution that actually empowers parents with leverage in PTA meetings, and if they need it, options to escape a system that just isn't listening to them on a lot of these issues. Um, the current School Choice Coalition, I think, um, and organizations are not really set up to make that argument as well as I hope they they would. Um, they're, they're kind of stuck thinking about this issue, in my opinion, as um, back in the 2000s when they had much more of a bipartisan coalition um, which is great, and I'm happy that bipartisan coalition happened. I wish that it was still around, um, but I, I think it's less and less relevant in either the Trump or the post-Trump era um, if we, we end up having one of those. Um, and, and finally, I think they make the argument for school choice on, on liberal and libertarian terms primarily. And, and that's basically what we've heard today, right? And there's nothing wrong with those arguments. I agree with those arguments. I think they're, they're great arguments. My chapter in this book um, is an example of both a libertarian and a liberal argument, right? Uh, I talk about how students with special needs are least well served by the current system and how choice and competition will empower families to then um, access better education for their children. That That is a absolutely true argument. As I said, I made it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm behind it 100%. However, that's a liberal and a libertarian argument. Um, I think that we do need to start making the conservative argument, which is, in my view, um, the only one that brings the kind of, of, of energy among the American people to this issue that doesn't sideline it as um, sort of a low priority issue the way that it has been for the right for too many of the last you know, several decades. I think we have to make this argument, which is, I think school choice is the only way to save America going forward. If, if we want um, to, to return to anything that looks like something that the founders would have recognized, if we don't want, um, you know, 
statues of George Washington toppled in the streets if we don't want uh, future generations to grow up having uh, being completely divorced um, from feeling any kind of love for their country or or, or believing that there is anything special, uh, anything unique and beautiful and wonderful and prosperous and free about America. I think we have to push the the, the gas pedal on school choice. So um, I'll close with that. Great, thank you, Inez. I was waiting for the the bald eagle to land on your shoulder there. That was uh, really well said. Hopefully, we can get school choice is the only way to save America T-shirts printed. Um, well, great remarks. Thank you all. We've had just a ton of excellent questions coming in. So, you know, I don't know who wants to tackle this. Maybe Corey. Uh, but we have a question from Kathy on how housing is segregated and therefore makes it harder to integrate schools. So. Can you talk about the nexus between housing and schooling and what that all means for families? Yeah, in the current system, your zip code determines your school. Uh, you live in a particular residence and you're residentially assigned to a particular government-run school, which uh, tends to lead to segregation in traditional public schools. Uh, if you look at the maps of the uh, redlining in the 1930s, a lot of the times they, they mirror the uh, the residential zoning of, of school assignment in the U.S. in current day. And so this kind of gets to Phil's chapter as well. It actually turns out when you give families a choice to escape these racially and economically segregated school systems in the public school system by allowing families to take their children's education dollars to a different type of uh, system or, or school type, it actually leads to racial integration. There's nine studies on this. Eight out of the nine studies find that on net, school choice actually leads to racial integration, which is the opposite of the theories that have been put forth by uh, the teachers unions arguing that school choice you know, leads to segregation or that it has segregationist origins. The actual evidence uh, suggests the opposite. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, well, our public schools are already segregated by because of this residential assignment. And then another thing, it leads to segregation by race and income. This, this also, you know, uh, leads to the fact that school choice is an equalizer. You know, uh, rich families already have school choice and by mortgage. They can already afford to live in the best uh, communities that are assigned to the highest quality uh, traditional public schools. They can already afford to pay out of pocket for private school tuition and fees. So school choice is also an equalizer and that it, it allows less advantaged families to uh, choose their schools as well. And this residential assignment also obviously leads to monopoly power. Um, uh, so, you know, allowing people to choose and get away from residentially assigned schools leads to competitive pressures as well. And the public schools actually tend to get better in response to school choice. 28 studies exist on this topic. 26 of the 28 studies find statistically significant positive effects of school choice competition on the children who remain in the traditional public school system. So in that sense, school choice is a rising tide that lifts all boats. And you don't even have to use a school choice voucher to benefit from it because the public schools start to think a little bit and they start to allocate their dollars more effectively so they can compete and so that they don't lose funding associated with those students. Great, and Corey, while you have the floor, you actually anticipated a question from Olivia who asked, Corey, I heard you on the Relatable podcast and remember you stating, I believe 27 studies that showed public schools improving when a charter school opened nearby in most of the areas. Can you tell me where I could find the citations for that? Yeah, Ed Choice has the one, two, threes of school choice. Uh, so if you just type in one, two, threes of school choice, Ed Choice on Google, you'll find that. But there's also a peer reviewed systematic review and meta analysis of this evidence in a journal called Educational Policy. The first author on this is Jab Jabbar, J-A-B-B-A-R, published in 2019. And that also finds that when you pool all of the averages together of these effects, it's a slight positive impact on the outcomes of the children in the traditional public schools. And I also just wanna point out, even if this evidence was negative, that still wouldn't be a legitimate argument to take away people's freedom to choose their schools for their children. Advantaged families that still have that freedom, regardless of what happens in the traditional public schools, when they take their kids out of the public school system, why shouldn't less advantaged families be able to do the same thing? Um, so the, you know, a, a, a disadvantaged family's right to choose their child's educational institution shouldn't hinge on the competitive response of the government-run school system. But all that aside, the evidence does suggest that the public schools do get better. 
Great, thank you. So Inez and Phil both probably want to tackle this. We're getting quite a few questions on the capacity for school choice to push back against uh, the, the term used here was massive radical left indoctrination of K-12 education. Can you talk a little bit about how that would work, um, you know, ways in which it would sort of diminish what is perceived to be a leftward turn in K-12 schools? Sure, maybe I'll tackle this one first. Um, I, I think it comes down to one word, which is empowerment or leverage, whichever one you prefer. Um, what we're seeing on a lot of these issues is that parents are getting mobilized and they are upset. Um, and, and I'm saying here, not just critical race theory, not just 1619, which are amazing mobilizers of parents, um, but also issues uh, surrounding human sexuality, for example. Um, California passed about a year ago, passed an extraordinarily radical um, curriculum, sex ed curriculum that goes all the way down to kindergarten. Um, and, and has some extremely radical uh, sort of elements to it. Even in the very liberal town in which I grew up in the Bay Area in California, um, there were thousands of parents who signed a petition to keep that curriculum out of the schools um, in their area. And guess what? That curriculum is implemented in those schools over the voices of parents. Um, and so I, I think we, we talk a lot about how school choice, I think, provides an avenue for um, students who do get a tax credit scholarship, who do get an ESA, who do get a, a voucher, uh, but just shifting the incentives. I think Corey talks a lot about the incentives within the current system not being aligned to have parents' voices even you know, in, in the top 10 priorities. And we saw that in spades, right, in this school reopening debate. Um, that The system we have in the public schools is not set up uh, to to be able to give parents enough power to push back against this kind of stuff. Um, and that's why school choice is so important. If you have that meeting where you have the 1,500 parents, 1,600 parents who have signed a petition, and you have a representative go in uh, to meet with the principal, to meet with the school administrator, um, you're going to have a very different meeting if all of those families represent uh, what, what the average is basically 14 and a half, maybe Corey can, can spit out the exact number, but 14 and a half, uh, $1,000 uh, annually that is spent on every child's education on average in America. Um, if each one of those names means potentially 15 grand walking out the door and you come with a list of a thousand names, you're going to have a very different meeting about critical race theory than you than you would without that kind of leverage. So, uh, and I think that's important even for families who do not exit the system, who are otherwise happy with their public schools, but are very upset about what their kids are learning either in social studies, um, in in civics, or uh, about human sexuality, or about other hot button uh, cultural issues. I think that leverage is all important. So that's how I think this this is going to be. It's not going to be a silver bullet, right? This is still a, a, a culture war battle that we're going to be fighting for quite some time. But right now, the left owns our $700 billion public investment in education, in K-12 education every year. And we should stand up and acclaim our piece of that investment so that it's not going, not just to, as Corey talks about, a, a, um, a monopoly in terms of delivering products and services, but an ideological monopoly. I see that we can, it can only improve by breaking that ideological mo monopoly. And I'll jump in. Uh, I think it's exactly perfectly put. It is an ideological monopoly that we see in the public school system, but the real benefit of, uh, of vouchers and alternatives uh, to a uniform public school curriculum is that it does open the door for an alternative viewpoint. It uh, opens the door for something to challenge a, um, a, a top-down, uh, organized and political messaging that has unfortunately captured quite a bit of our public school curriculum. Uh, we don't have to be the majority to counter that. We simply have to offer an alternative voice, and the whole idea is that people will shift. Uh, in addition to vouchers, uh, you know, we we have to keep uh, the fight on on um, on some of these curricular battles and curricular issues. Uh, the 1619 project, and it was mentioned as a uh, uh, a particular strong front of that. Although, as we've seen over the last year, I've been involved in these battles, as has uh, Reason Magazine, as has Heritage, uh, as has Independent Women's Forum, 
in countering the misinformation that's not only coming from the public school system, but th uh, from things like the, uh, the New York Times. Uh, so I wrote a um, an entire book length critique that I've got here of the 1619 project that is offering an alternative curriculum of the United States history that tells uh, the problems that are associated with uh, this anti-capitalist, uh, anti-free market, uh, anti-American liberty, uh, American constitutionalism message that came out of the major newspaper. And even though that battle is still ongoing, I think we've drawn a, enough scrutiny to it that there's even some pushback internal to the New York Times right now. Uh, many of you may have seen Brett Stevens wrote an entire column critiquing his own newspaper for spreading not only uh, bad history and bad curricular advice, but outright misinformation and even editing the text to, uh, to take out some of the controversial claims uh, that had existed in the 1619 Project's original version. Uh, so keeping up the, uh, the the push on that front, keeping uh, the other side's fire uh, feet to the fire, um, making educational curricular materials available for adoption as an alternative is a major part of our strategy in, in combating this. And again, we just got to keep remembering we don't have to be the majority. We don't have to take over the entire public school system. That's what the left has done uh, with their curricular decisions. We simply need to offer the alternative and have confidence that intelligent people, uh, intelligent parents that actually care about their, their children's education uh, will evaluate the evidence and, and, and make the right choice. Great. Well said. Well, uh, we are at time. We promised to let you go at 11.45. We got so many great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer them all there, but this will be archived and available 24 hours uh, after the event. So with that, Corey, Inez, Phil, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, don't forget to put in your order for School Choice Myths available on Amazon. And thank you again for joining us today.